Well, thank you all for turning out. It's Friday afternoon. Uh, we have the room until 5 o'clock, but you don't have to speak, Julie, until 5 o'clock, just to let you know. Okay. Um, so Julie Sykes, let me introduce you quickly to Julie, and then she's going to take it away and show you all the great stuff that they're doing at the University of Oregon at Castles. Julie Sykes earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota with a focus on applied linguistics and second language acquisition. Her research focuses on the use of digital technologies for language acquisition with a specific focus on interlanguage pragmatic development and intercultural competence. She's taught courses on second language teaching and learning, methodology and research, language learning and technology, Hispanic linguistics, and interlanguage pragmatic development. Julie's experience includes the, de the design, implementation, and evaluation of online immersive spaces and the creation of place-based augmented reality mobile games to engage learners in a variety of non-institutional contexts. And you're going to be talking about some of those today, right? She's published very, various articles on um, computer-assisted language learning related topics, including synchronous computer-mediated communication and pragmatic development, gaming and computer-assisted language learning, and lexical acquisition in digitally mediated environments. She serves as the University of Oregon Scholar in Residence and also holds a faculty appointment in the Department of Linguistics. Julie Sykes, give her a big hand. Thank you, Carl, for that nice introduction. Um, I am going to talk about lots of these things, kind of all mixed together and remixed together. It's a very long title. Um, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, just sort of how this interdisciplinary work um, goes. Before I begin, though, anyone who tells you we do this kind of work alone is wrong. Um, I think academia, we always think of as being this sort of isolated, solitary space. That's not actually the case, especially when we start talking about digital technologies and games and these big projects that we're working on. So a special thank you to Carl and his team and to Natalie and Sarah and Betsy for bringing me here um, and to Dale. I've known Dale since I was first starting as an MA student and she's like, keep going, keep going. It's going to be great. Um, and she still talked to me after I didn't come to UT for grad school, which I really appreciated. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you for that as well. Also, my team at home, the Castles team, um, we have 12 of us who work. We're sister LRC to Coral here at Texas. Um, and three of my closest collaborators on many of the games we're going to talk about today, Chris Holden at the University of New Mexico, Peter Moore, who built my very first ever 3D game. Um, he's at the University of Minnesota and Steve Thorne. And so just an acknowledgement that this work is a collective body of the kind of work we're doing and hopefully that all of us keep doing. Um, it's part of the open education space, right, is learning to collaborate not only on the kinds of things we do, but the thinking that we do as well. I'm not going to talk two hours, I promise you that. The goal is maybe an hour and then lots of time for discussion, questions, interaction as we need it. Um, the talk really has three goals and three parts as we go through. The first is to explore discourse and language as used by the community in which we live. Um, a big part of that is the digital world, which is where I'm going to focus. And so I want us to just get a sense of why all of this is so important and why it's so complicated. Digital isn't the only place these things are happening, but they're a really nice, salient, clear place to think about them. We can see them happening in real time, which is really fun. Um, we're also going to consider an operationalized approach to L2 pragmatic development that is hopefully more reflective of this comprehensive set of skills learners need, moving beyond the idea that pragmatics is a set of strategies or functions we put in different orders and make them work. It's something bigger and more complicated or comprehensive than that. And then we're going to talk about utilizing technological innovation to make this systemic, right? If we actually could scale innovation in the ways that we're doing, what would that look like and how can we do that? Digital tools being sort of the primary space that allows us to do things on the back end we can't do in face-to-face -face environments. And if we think of those digital tools in that way, we can sort of expand and increase the opportunities to do that kind of work. So sound good, everyone on board? That's kind of the journey we're gonna take today anyway. Um, so starting with the idea about digital language and digital discourse, the numbers here aren't necessarily important other than looking at the increased and prolific use of internet users, social media users, unique mobile users, in other words the number of mobile of accounts right is increasing, active 
mobile social users. 30%, right? Critical to thinking about this, we think of it as, oh, I just wish people would get off their phones and talk to people. What is happening here? What's actually happening is people are talking to people, and they're so grossly engaged with talking to people, they're unable to look up. So we have to think about how those behave. Good, bad, I'm not saying either one is good or bad, but it's inaccurate to express the idea that they're not talking to people. They are not interacting face to face with people. They are engaging with often people in different ways in those spaces. And it's part of understanding language and the things that we need to do. The other thing I want to show you is active users of these global social platforms. Um, Facebook being at the top, I bet that's gone down actually um, in the last three weeks. Um, <laughs> the point being, these are high stakes environments worth billions and billions of dollars. The behaviors that are happening in Twitter since the presidential election have skyrocketed the stocks of that company for a reason. Right? All of a sudden, people are paying attention, good or bad. Again, I want to be cautious not to place value over positively on the technological space or undervalue it. That's the trick. It's a neutral space that we have to try to figure out and try to dig into. And we'll get to language learning here in a minute, I promise. Um, Thornsworo and Smith really accurately point out, I think, that the internet has qualitatively transformed everyday communication and actually constitutes a multiplicity of language contact zones really unprecedented in human history. On top of that, I would add, we have access to them. Unlike language contact zones where we fly to borders and we look at what's happening and we collect field data, we can look at tons and tons of data really, really quickly. Just to make this point, and I hope I've pulled some examples you're familiar with, and some many of you are probably like, what the heck is she talking about? Um, that's exactly the point here. One is thinking of Facebooking, right? How many of you have used Facebooking as a verb, right? 10 years ago, that didn't even exist as a word, right? Now it is inherent part of digital and non digital discourse. Facebook doesn't just happen in Facebook. Facebook happens everywhere. Even if you're saying, I'm no longer going to use Facebook. Right? Um, hashtags, I would argue we're not quite done with the analysis, but I would argue hashtags are the number one marker of pragmatic behavior in electronic discourse that we've seen. It's the way we mark socio-pragmatics, it's the way we mark context in different backgrounds, it's the way people categorize themselves with other groups of people. Um, some pretty salient hashtags we've seen recently with really high stakes consequences, things like delete Facebook, the Me Too movement, right? There are all these, this is just two examples of all these things that are happening. But then also we have really neutral hashtags that mark context, that do different things, right? That change and sort of give us more insight into the actual text or the actual image that's happening. Finally, um, thinking about the Emoji Movie. Has anyone seen the Emoji Movie? I have two small kids, so I've seen it for a reason. Um, not because I was dying to watch the Emoji Movie. Um, anyone know what it's about? You've seen it. What's it about? Yeah, my kid, right? So essentially, it's about this meh guy, right? He's a meh emoji, and emojis are only supposed to have one expression, and meh has tons of expressions, and he can change his expressions all the time. So he is viewed as a malfunction. And the entire movie is about living in the world of this phone, of this one particular human being, and the entire ecosystem of that telephone. The cloud, all the apps they go through, how it gets deleted, and they have essentially personified technological innovation of the last 10 years. Um, if you are not familiar with these things, it makes absolutely no sense. None whatsoever, right? It's a context that is worth talking about in that people are so familiar, more specifically four to 12 year olds, <laughs> are familiar enough with these kind of spaces that it's becoming ubiquitous as part of their life. Um, finally, to make the point that humans change technology. Yes, technology of course changes humans, right? Absolutely. The other reality is we make lots of choices to ensure that the discursive behaviors we like in our context exist. Dot, dot, dot. It's my favorite one. My favorite innovation in technology. Why? Anyone know? Someone who studies pragmatics and cares a lot about how people interact. 
Why do I like it? What does dot, dot, dot mean? Does anyone know what I'm talking about when you're texting, right? Somebody's writing something. Somebody's writing. There's someone on the other end. Do I interrupt their turn? Do I not interrupt their turn? It was added because people like turn-taking mechanisms. We can show turn-taking patterns in all kinds of discursive situations, including digital environments, of which learners have to understand. Um, just to give you a little bit of comic relief, we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm not going to show you the whole thing. There's a little bit of profanity, and I don't need to cause that on the video anyway. But I do want to show you this because I think it's a really interesting commentary on where we are. The point being, right, fundamentally changing social behavior, right? Ten years ago, five years ago, no one would have been too concerned, right? Now it's like, what? What's going on? Maybe we still aren't. I don't know. But the point is, it's for some, it's actually a fundamental shift in the kinds of things that are happening. Are we good? All right. Um, not all of it's good. I, this is one of my favorite articles out of the New York Times, if you haven't read it. Everyone know what Alexa is? It's the stand-up speaker, sort of real-time mm -hmm. AI, goes into everyone's homes and does really cool things for you. Um, Co-parenting with Alexa. What does that look like? I can attest to it. Alexa has a personality in our house. Um, she's not going to exist very long. See, she even has a name and a gender. Um, my kids require you to be polite with Alexa. So if you come into the house, my dad was there. And he's like, Alexa, turn on the music. And Lily goes, you need to say please, dad. Right? All these kinds of things. This article goes on to talk about what does this mean for the personification of machines and technology. Again, not necessarily good. Um, not necessarily bad. We don't actually know. I mean, we see lots of research on digital distraction. We see lots of research on our inability to calm down and on focus. That's really important. We have to pay attention to that, too. Um, therefore, when thinking about language and this multiplicity of complications around how human interaction happens, pragmatics comes right back to the core, right? Pragmatics <clears throat> being the way we communicate meaning with each other. It means it doesn't actually matter what your structure looks like if you're unable to sort of manipulate it by context. It means we have to shape and adapt and move and do all kinds of things on the fly. Um, also not something we see in typical language curricula. Let's take, for example, this. Sorry, one sec. Mm. All right, let's take the utterance. Let's grab a cup of coffee sometime. Let's grab a cup of coffee sometime. I am at a new reception we've just met for the first time. We're chatting and I say, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. How many of you think I have full intention of going to coffee with you within the next two weeks? How many of you are like, oh, yeah, she's just saying, getting out of the conversation maybe. Right? I mean, that's what it is. Mostly, most often used as a pre-closer. Right? In situations of meeting someone new, it's a pre-closer that we use to end a conversation. Great, grammar's fine. Actually kind of colloquial in the right context. The meaning causes all kinds of miscommunication. Learners of English come to the United States. They get all these invitations that aren't actually invitations. So they think American students are shallow and offer all these sort of unintended things. American students are like, why are they so clingy? Why are they following me everywhere? What's going on, Julie? The reality is it's just a mismatch in how that invitation occurred. Even more so things as simple as words, right? Coffee. In this case, coffee might mean a Coke, it might mean a water, it might mean a tea, it might mean all kinds of things. But in every single language textbook, what do we see? Coffee, a picture that looks like that, right? So we have to think of language more differently, even more so when we get to social media. This is a really old one. There are lots of new ones. You can Google it, Social Media Explained. You'll see all. This is the original. And I like the original the best. So you can look at the newest version. Some of these don't even exist anymore. The idea being they demonstrate the fundamentally distinct idea of digital context. Pragmatics is at the heart of what is going on here. Right? Twitter, I'm eating a donut. Hashtag donut. Right? I like donuts. This is where I eat donuts. There's all kinds of information encoded in this language. It is not enough to say, hey, use social media. Well, what social media? What kind of social media? What's going on? What do you mean? Blog post? What? what? 
So the point is, we can never actually teach learners all of those things. I could never say, do this on Facebook, do this on Twitter, do this on Snapchat, which I don't use and don't understand. Do this on Twitter, which I actually try to avoid. Do this on all, right? It's an impossible feat for a language teacher to teach everything. Now, on top of that, it's impossible to teach you everything that has nothing to do with digital discourse as well. Language variety, individual choices, personalities, preferences. So our goal has to be to get at skills, dispositions, and behaviors that enable learners to do this kind of work with language themselves. Right? They have to get the skills that they need to deal with meaning, right? Fundamental canonical definition of pragmatics. The way meaning is understood and the way meaning is communicated between a group of speakers. Right? Intended, assumptions, force, what happens with all of these pieces. And we do that kind of in two ways, talking about functions, understanding is it an invitation or is it a pre-closing, understanding how you might accomplish certain things with language, but also a set of skills and strategies around that. From another perspective, Leo Van Leer calls this the ecological or systemic approach, right? Extending sort of our understanding of pragmatics to include things about context, about emergent patterns that are always changing, the need to adapt consistently to changing conditions, which happens all the time. The variability that is no longer a nuisance, but actually a sign of vitality in a culture. I mean, I think that's one of the things about Leo's work that was so interesting is it said, pay attention. When something is living and alive, it's always changing. And if we don't teach our language students to do that, we're doing them a certain disservice as multilingual participants in that society. That being said, we have a little bit of a problem. And it's a problem that we've been working on for a long time. Right? I wish I could say I got to do, Dale's been doing it much longer than I have, Carl, right? This kind of work about how do we do this in formal instructional context? How do we actually say, I care more about your ability to interact in the world than I care about your ability to use a preposition correctly? Because although I do care about your accuracy eventually because it's the only way to do meaning, I need you to pay attention first. Why is it so difficult, right? And happy to share any of these references. This is a very subset of this immense language variety, personality. Individual perceptions just about the world, right? Some people prefer a flatter affect than other people. Many people are like, Julie, calm down, right? That is a preference about how we engage in things we're excited about or things we're not excited about. It's always dynamic and co-constructed. There are lots of moments when you stop and you say, I'm really sorry, I didn't really mean it like that. I can tell it upset you. Can we start over? Rewind. Right? But if we're always chalking it up to, oh, I might have not gotten the right word, right? That's a different thing when we talk about language learners and we talk about multilingualism in particular. Um, in order to uh, tackle these problems, we've looked at a number of different things. One is a model around how we do this, and that is observing, analyzing, and extending. The goal being first, you get learners to just pay attention. I want you to look at how this invitation sequence works. Do you notice that in Spanish, they insist at least three times? Almost across the board, most varieties, I'm going to say most, I'll never say every, most varieties of Spanish insist at least more than once, but in most cases, it's three times. Hey, you want to come to this thing? No, I really can't. No, you really have to come. No, I can't. No, no, really, without you, it's not going to be the same. And as you refuse each time, what do you have to do? Anyone know? your quiz, your pragmatics quiz of the day. What? More evidence that you can't go. More evidence that you can't go, or you soften your refusal. First is like, no, 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 I have to work. I'm really, really sorry. I'd love to, but no, 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 you have to be there. Well, maybe I could try, but really, this project is really important. And lots of times, not always, most often by the end, it's like, okay, okay, I'll try really hard. <laughs> the I'll try really hard means what? No, <laughs> right? You're not going, but what happens to a learner, an English speaker who's a learner of Spanish, what happens? All of a sudden, they're like, they're coming. They said they'd really try, and no one shows up. And what? Right? The meaning and the intention matter. 
right? Perfect structures without that understanding of meaning doesn't do that. So getting learners to pay attention to those kinds of behaviors. My students always say, I hate it. And I'm like, what? They're like, once you see it, you can't stop seeing it. And it is true, right? Once you start thinking about language in that way, it becomes almost impossible to be like, oh, they might not actually be mad. Maybe we just didn't do that right. Right? Like maybe we had different ideas about what happened in this space. Oh, now I have to actually think about it. <laughs> right? Um, it doesn't mean we don't get to be mad. It means we get to decide when and how, and we can use language the most effectively in those places. Then we have them analyze and then extend that to the world in which they live, right? Analysis means I want you to pull this apart. It can go directly side by side with the kinds of activities we do in language classrooms anyway, right? We can fill in greeting sequences and we can take two extra minutes to put those greeting sequences on a continuo of who you'd use them with. We can talk about past, uh, let's see, we can talk about obligations in the future. And instead of just looking at the utterances and the structure for creating those obligations, we can match an obligation with its appropriate context. I'd really like to, but, right? It's a mitigator. Most often it counts as a mitigator. And so doing these kinds of intentional tiny little tweaks gets us started, right? Those are the kinds of things we think about in those models. Um, so what we've done is we've actually intentionally said, okay, we know about this model, we know these are the things that are tricky. We also know that digital games specifically, and also other digital technologies, enable us to overcome those really, really difficult barriers to pragmatic instruction. For example, if we think about individual personality choice as one of these many difficulties, I can actually give an individual experience to a user in a game that's systematic. So as a player, I go in as me or my avatar, or my character, I encounter that digital world. We're talking about this one here. Crooked line, this is an old school one. We can actually encounter this digital world as ourselves based on our personalities, looking at what we're interested in, while also systematically building in the kinds of pragmatic behavior we want. In this case, it was requests and apologies. You got to mess around. Instead of me saying, I need you to request like this and apologize like this in Spanish, it says, try it out. Here's what we know more generally. Here's what we know more generally. Um, and here's what you can do if you want to mess around. You break a glass with a vendor in the market. You can choose how to repair that. If you do it well, the vendor get, is happy. If you do it poorly, the vendor is mad. But it's not me as a teacher saying, do this, do that, do that. Um, that's just one small example. Happy to talk more about that. Um, not necessarily the focus here. We do it with mobile games. So Mentira and Ecopod are two games built on mobile devices that actually engage you out into the neighborhood. With Mentira, you go out. You're part of one of four families. You have clues you have to uncover in order to solve a murder mystery. The better you are at pragmatics, the better clues you get. So each family has a very clearly, stereotypically salient, pragmatic set of behaviors. One requires deference and mitigation. One requires directness. You have to figure out which is which to get the right clues. You do really well, you have the right clues. You do really poorly, your person in your family is probably going to jail in the trial because you didn't get enough evidence. We actually asked them to walk around the neighborhood where this occurred, a historical fiction overlaid on actual Spanish-speaking neighborhoods in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You have to use your digital device that you're using anyway to look up, right? I want to facilitate your experience in the seemingly neutral, Maybe on interesting neighborhoods, you some of them have been there a hundred times and not even known this neighborhood really matters, right? Ecopod is about cultural narrative and sort of socio-pragmatics. Again, not the focus here and happy to return to any of these projects as we get going. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it. The two I really want to dig into are games to teach because Carl wanted me to talk about games, <laughs> as well as Lingro to go. Two of our one sort of an ongoing project and one as an extended project of what we're doing right now to get these kinds of information into classrooms across the country. Um, it's one thing for my Spanish students and Dale's Spanish students to do pragmatics. It's a whole other thing when you're training hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teachers to do this kind of work that doesn't actually exist in textbooks anywhere. 
right? We don't have one yet that has really clear pragmatic information. But before we sort of dig into the tech a little bit, I wanted to give you a little preview of what we're looking at. Um, we have to understand the what. If we don't start to operationalize what pragmatics is, it becomes everything, right? It becomes overwhelming. It becomes this space where all of a sudden we're like, yeah, maybe we should just kind of let learners do this on their own. I'm pretty good at this other stuff that we're good at. Um, so what we did is actually with my team, we um, pulled apart 58 key publications in intercultural communicative competence and L2 pragmatics. And we said, found 15 different instruments, 35 distinct coding schema. They're all primarily theoretical in nature. And it is so heterogeneous, it becomes impossible to figure out what we're talking about. All essentially purporting to talk about the exact same construct, right? So what we did is we said, let's pull it all apart and let's look at what's in common across all of these models. If we look at what we all could sort of narrow down to the essence of this kind of skill and behavior, what does that look like? Um, this is what we came up with, four dimensions of L2 or interactional pragmatic competence. Two on the analytical side and two on the affective side. So not, and I'll look at these more closely in a minute. Knowledge being what we're used to, right? The kinds of things that you need to actually perform specific functions, the strategies. Um, analysis then being your ability to figure out why those are used and what's different about them. Then on the other side, on the more affective side is looking at subjectivity, a learner's choice. How do we know when a learner chooses to deviate from norms? or when they just don't know. That's a really big difference, right? Sometimes we actually choose not to adopt the norm of a culture we're learning about, of a language we're learning. And maybe contrary, and maybe this is kind of controversial, we shouldn't have to, right? This idea that learners are becoming like natives actually is the wrong construct. You're never going to be like them, right? Claire Crumpsch talks about this all the time. You instead are figuring out how you fit in a productive, meaningful, multilingual, globalized space. And that's our goal to figure that out. Um, but I want to know. I don't want my students to fake it, right? I don't want them to be like, oh, I'm just choosing not to do that. <laughs> really? <laughs> right? What are we going to do with that? And then finally, just awareness that this matters in the world, right? Um, three basic assumptions that we pulled from these. And they're really, really important because they definitely move this model into a space that might be a little bit different from what people are used to in terms of ICC. One, all interaction is co-constructed. Our assumption is that absolutely you engage and decide on norms based on who you're talking to, period. There might be patterns, there might not, right? And so we need to be okay with that. Also, any kind of profile like this is irreducible to a single score, right? It's irreducible to say, hey, I'm gonna give you a pragmatic competence score, like we do with an OPI or with a proficiency level, there has to be some sort of profile associated with this. And likely, many profiles equal productive language users and language interactants. And finally, we're talking about skills, not attitudes. Um, many of the frameworks we look at talk about preferences, talk about kinds of food you're willing to eat, talk about places you're willing to sleep. Um, from our perspective and from our analysis, that actually doesn't have anything to do with your ability to communicate well with humans. If I only want to eat macaroni and cheese the rest of my life, my four-year-old, at least that's what she does, I at least need to say, I really would prefer only to eat this. Or you don't have to be this sort of adventurous, open to everything kind of person. That has benefits in other ways, of course. But it doesn't actually tell us much about your ability to interact well with human beings. Right? Um, just to give you a sense of what this framework looks like, um, on the knowledge side, we have four areas, right? One, recognizes and produces varying speech styles. Identifies and produces routine formula in multiple domains. In other words, I can invite someone with a friend in a service encounter, I don't know why you'd invite, um, and in a professional space, et cetera. Interprets and produces implicature in multiple domains, implicature being one of the fundamental pieces of pragmatics and intercultural that is really tricky. Um, and then demonstrates knowledge of varying cultural dimensions and social distinctions. So you actually can start thinking about, oh, with the leave taking, I need to start this much earlier than I was anticipating as you go through. The analysis piece, 
uses um, conscious strategies to repair miscommunication, right? You actually can stop and say, ooh, something went weird there, right? Something didn't happen like I intended. Identifies and evaluates intended interlocutor meaning and can figure out why. And describes dimensions impacting discourse patterns, things like turn taking. You can actually give a meta analysis or what we might call meta pragmatic skills would fall into this piece of that. Subjectivity looks at demonstrating the ability to make conscious choices about discursive patterns and behaviors and can discern individual personality from cultural norms. Right? You have to know if the person you're interacting with is sort of an odd duck, right? Or if it's like, oh, this is something I'm going to have to really get used to as I work through this culture. Finally, on the awareness scale, demonstrates awareness of others' perspectives. This is more general. So analysis really focuses in on the language piece of those pragmatic pieces, the discursive piece, maybe even gestures. Awareness opens that up to a bigger space. And then recognizes motives and reasons for actions of oneself. Often that thinks about, that means we're talking about cultural background, history, why there's this long standing assumption about certain things from long, long ago, right? There is a historical space that you have to pay attention to. Um, so that is the perspective we're taking in much of this work as we sort of dive into the games and the tech and what do we do. Again, as you can see, it's sort of this complex picture that when all together you're like, oh yeah, cool. Trying to isolate all of those pieces is what's really difficult. And that's what we're trying to figure out how to do. Um, and that's what we call addressing the how, right? That's what we're going to sort of dig into. Great. So how do we do any of this? Um, one is taking advantage of the affordances of digital technologies. Um, these can be validated. They can be scaled. And we can get lots and lots and lots of data. We can actually try to figure out what's happening both pre and post, but also during. Um, for example, in some of the Croquetlandia research I did originally, we had 120 hours of gameplay data, plus pre-post, plus 65 hours of interview data. We had all these learners who were doing okay, right? And all of a sudden I'm like, what's going on with this group of learners? They did pretty well on their products. Pre-post shows change. What's really going on? Because they don't quite seem to get the stuff we're talking about. I went in, they never had touched the game. They learned from their friends. They had accounts of the game. They knew all this stuff about the game, all this attendant discourse work. But the data actually could tell us, like, oh, of course, they never actually did this piece. And so we have to think through the process when we're looking at innovation and we're trying to figure out building interventions for lots and lots of people. Um, again, as I mentioned, the first place we went um, and the place I was most interested in is digital games. Mostly because of their ability to do complicated things in pretty simple ways. Um, the games themselves to build are really difficult. The ideas about what we put in them are really challenging. But in the end, we actually see a pretty straightforward. You know when you play a good game. How many of you have actually liked to play games? Maybe I should say kind of complicated games. Uh, how many of you are like, no way. That's allowed to, right? Um, what we know about games and learning is that they're very good at goal orientation and goal-directed activity without taking away player agency. The goals of the game are really clear. My learning objectives are really, really clear, right? I want you to do this, whatever that looks like. In my case, it's I want you to learn pragmatics. In some cases, it's I want you to conquer the world. In other cases, it's I want you to rescue the princess. But you get to decide how you get there. Um, also, we see a strong social consequence of that, whether that's in the game, which actually is pretty low stakes, more it's around the game, right? People who play that game as well also really care about what happens. And a willingness to communicate. Um, Rangers and Watana have some really interesting work on using games and getting learners willing to speak up, right? In ways that they don't do in typical classrooms. Also a strong potential for language socialization, or in other words, learning something new as you go through a community. It simulates really well what it's like to not know anything in this really complicated world, all the way through like, yeah, I'm an expert. I can do this. If you liken it to an airport the first time you ever get off in a target, target language country and you've never been there before and you're like, I got this. I at least can get my suitcase. And you look and it's, what? Right? But you know this sign matters, and so you can filter there. And you know that, and games do that really well. They start you by focusing you and then get you to the bigger picture. Finally, complex feedback mechanisms. They're the only system, 
you're not the only. They're one of the few systems where we get individualized, real-time feedback. In other words, when you get killed, like it or not, in a game, it doesn't matter. It's the principle we care about. You get immediate feedback about what you did wrong, and you get to try again. And you can do that 25 times if you need to before you get it right. We also scaffold it really well in games. If we do the classic version, does that, Super Mario Brothers, if I say that, does everyone have some familiarity? It's a little man, right, Luigi, and they jump around. You start by jumping like this, right? Zoop. Then what happens? You have to do a double jump. Zoop, zoop. Then what happens? Ooh, you have to do a super jump. It's super hard, right? B to A. It has to go shoop. And then what happens? The cliff opens up underneath. All of a sudden, if you miss your super jump, you fall in. Versus before, you just jumped over. And so it scaffolds you into these kinds of behaviors that you get to practice over and over and over again, which is what we want with language, right? We want them to start sentence level, word level, and get to this discursive level intentionally without it feeling like they mess up all the time, right? That's what happens to learners. They make one mistake and it's like, I'm not talking again in this class, right? Like, I'm done. <laughs> Games do the exact opposite thing. Oh, I messed up. Oh, I got to get this. Hold on, mom. I just got to beat this level. It's my very favorite expression and the worst thing to hear, right? Because you're like, please, really? Could you stop playing this game? I get that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the behavior that says, hold on. I'm learning. Let me practice again, right? Those are the things that we actually really care about. So what we did then is we pulled it apart and we said, okay, great. For pragmatics, we get agency. We get the ability to deal with language variety. I can actually put a bunch of non-player characters in a game that have all kinds of varieties of Spanish, and you got to figure it out, right? Whoa, that person, ooh, that person's different than that person. Why are they so different? What's going on? And then as an instructor, I get to build in all kinds of wraparound analysis and reflection. It's like, why are they different? Let's dissect it. Let's look at it. Let's figure it out. Again, feedback we just talked about. In addition, context, right? Games have the ability to emotionally connect a user to the experience, not to the technology, to the experience, right? Um, they did some early research with the Stanley Milgram experiments of the 60s. Does everyone know what I'm talking about there? So it used to be you'd, it was an actual human. You sat in front of the screen and they would pay you to shock them. And the more you shocked them, the more pain. And they were looking at people's stress thresholds. And they would measure all kinds of neurological and brain things. What they did, they wanted to know how people relate to avatars in digital environments. So they actually replicated that exact study. And guess what they found? The same, if not worse. Right? The stress effect of stressing that avatar, probably having to do with temporal space and how we feel about shocking people in the 60s versus the 2000s, right? But what that told us, it's just one study. There's others, tons looking at avatar embodiment and identity integration. What it said is we might actually be able to create a role play that means something, right? What happens now when we give role plays? Here's some cards. You all have a scenario. What happens? Anyone have an idea? The yeah, they have to visualize the context, but I happened to get the doctor card and I never have any interest in being the doctor. Right? What happens? Huh? I'll be the doctor. Blah, blah, blah. What's wrong with blah, blah, blah? Right? And you see, you can watch it happen. You can watch the eyes glaze over. You can watch, or you can watch when a learner gets a role they're excited about and you're like, yes, I'm going to be. Oh, right. And you see these things happening. Um, and so the goal is actually to create role plays that mean something, right? To connect that emotional space to what's going on. Finally, again, language variation and variety being a fundamental goal of the kinds of things we do. Um, I talked a little bit about Mentira, um, the family murder mystery game. Ecopod is a separate kind of game in which we start to get at the awareness and metapragmatic side of things. So Mentira really looks at knowledge and analysis. In Spanish, for fourth semester students of Spanish, you have to know the routine formula and you have to analyze how they work across language varieties. 
Ecopod is all about the other side of that scale, the awareness side, where you say, I want you to pay attention to how it might be different. You have to survive a pandemic. It's based on the first year reading that every student read at the University of Oregon. So they've already read the novel. We used that novel. We turned it into a choose your own adventure game to see if you could live through the first 40 days of the pandemic, which is what happens in the book. And so they start by trying to survive in Oregon, and then they play in their target language, one of five languages, Japanese, Chinese, French, German, or Spanish. And all of a sudden, what you see happening is it feels weird, right? Because we gave them all the same choices. We gave them all the same narrative that we did in the English version. But what's the problem with that? The language is great. What's the problem? All the pragmatics, all the cultural pieces are completely off, right? And there are some countries in which you would get the choice, in this case, that you have to leave your room, get out, right? Get your stuff, get going, you're going to be in trouble. Some countries, you don't have that choice. In other places, you wouldn't even get a warning. And so what we asked learners to do then in wraparound with their instructors, with their groups, was we want you to actually figure out how to rewrite this narrative to make it pragmatically appropriate. So actually using game design as the learning tool. Playing was part of it, but they didn't play to learn. They actually had to rethink how to design as part of a narrative, essentially. Uh-huh. So what we do is we try to be true to the game character's colloquial language instead of the game's colloquial language. So in other words, in all of our games, Mentiras especially, because we had New Mexican Spanish and we intentionally put New Mexican Spanish in there. We had some speakers who tried to avoid that because we wanted to deal with the heritage language identity pieces. Um, is we're very true to a character and their persona. But we say in this imaginary game world, they all live together all the time. Right? So that's what's fun about games is we can sort of mess it up. We can mess with it. Um, but we also then make sure we account for all of those varieties, as many of them as we can. We don't get all of them, of course. Um, it has to, I mean, from my perspective, it has to be that way. Right? Games give us the opportunity to do that. Not doing so is sort of a disservice in a way that we can't do in a printed text sometimes. Right? There wouldn't be space to put all 200 greeting possibilities. Right? I think that's where we're at, right? In Spanish, I don't know. It's something like that. There are quite a few, right, of what you can do. Um, just to give you a sense of the data, this is the kind of thing we do. This is from Mentira. We plot out how users do it, how they work with it. Um, we find there's a ton of value. Um, here's what the research shows us so far. <coughs> One, place is key to the creation of meaningful fictional stories. We need the place, so they going out into that neighborhood really matters. Uh, mobile technologies can facilitate complex interactions in the community. One of my favorite stories, anyone familiar with Albuquerque understands what I mean when I say cholo, right? So you have, it's a very clear persona. It's a very clear, not to be stereotypical, but rather a piece that they themselves self-identify with, right? You have to have the right truck and the right painting and the right tires and the right music. I mean, everything about this identity matters. And sometimes it's scary to learners, good, bad, indifferent. They're was a house where his grandmother was living. Our students are out playing. He pulls up his truck, and they're like, not quite sure. They stopped, and they're like, hey, check out our game, right? And they engage him with this game. Next thing I know, 45 minutes later, they're all checking out the truck. The game has gone. Who knows where, what happened to it, right? And it became a real community interaction in that place. And that in and of itself showed up in their data over and over and over again. Now I see Spanish matters. He loved it when I knew these words, right? Those kinds of things um, in a way that they wouldn't get otherwise. There's Joe, the sausage guy. He lives on the neighborhood. He has a food cart. He d sells green chili sausage. If you ever go to Los Criegos in Albuquerque, get a sausage from Joe. It's delicious. Um, <laughs> but he also facilitates, oh, let me tell you about the history of Spanish in this neighborhood. Let me tell you about what my mom did. I don't speak Spanish anymore, but let me tell you what it's like. Right? It changes fundamentally the kinds of interactions we care about. Is it true if I tested them on predator versus imperfect after that experience, they do worse? Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> eventually, though, they'd be able to tell us that story really, really well using the structures they need in a way that matters to them. And that's what really matters in the kind of work that we're looking at. We'd get there. It's not that it's gone forever. It's that we're requiring a bigger picture earlier. Um, 
So some things that we've been working on also, as I mentioned, one is we build games, right? I'm under no illusion everyone in this room even wants to build a game, <laughs> or can, or should. It doesn't, the idea is, this takes teams of people, and I would say I'm not the game designer, right? I'm the language person. So we always have teams of game designers that come in and work with us. Um, this is one of my very favorites that you can start right away. Um, this is on Games to Teach. It's a freely available resource as part of our LRC grant. This is the kind of work that we do. Um, it's called Parable of the Polygons. Has anyone ever played this? Nikki Case is by far one of my favorite game designers. He's out of Portland. Um, this is essentially a story game blog. It's an interactive website where you learn about race. You think about race and you have to keep your squares and your triangles happy. That's your goal. And the way that you're happy is when you're by people who are the same as you and different than you. But there are certain proportions of how many sameness and how many different, and they're squares and triangles, right? It, totally neutralized in that space. But as you go through, the game starts to teach you about, oh, look what happened. Everyone ended up segregated anyway in their own groups. Why does that happen? Why are humans like that? And it gives you a neutral space to engage with these kinds of issues in language courses. And so we've built out a full set of activities that a teacher could do tomorrow. You can download them, they're freely available at the novice, intermediate, and advanced levels based on national standards for proficiency, throwing in as much pragmatics as we can because pragmatics are fairly void from those standards. Um, we also have a number of similar activities around commercial games. So instead of building our own games, Let's use what's already out there. Let's use what people are putting millions of dollars into, and let's do something with it around these language issues. Let's get learners engaged. Um, these are just three examples. SimCity Build It. It's a simulation game around building your own city. We have all kinds of activities about city planning, about cultural differences, economics. And as you get into more advanced levels, obviously the topics get more advanced. Right, novice level, we're looking at words and structures and textures. Um, by the end, you're having to look at, in this case, play gink, you're having to look at making decisions about where world aid goes. How are those decisions made? And what role does language have in those decisions? Um, you can see the languages these are available for. So the idea is you play the language in your target language. There are activity packs. They look kind of like this directly associated with those. This is just the summary, so you can get an idea, right? At the novice level, you have to recognize and understand basic vocabulary to, in order to play the game. You have to understand and follow basic instructions. You have to list relevant places around town and describe the locations. We do that all the time, right? Um, and so it gives us a way to get at some of these issues um, from the beginning, in addition to building kind of our own games. The newest project that we have um, is called lingro to go I'm really, really excited about this. It's a freely available app. It's a partnership with Lingro Learning. Um, you can download the app now on your iPhones. It's easy to do, or on your Android devices. Um, if you ever run out of coins, just shoot me an email. I'll send you a bunch of new free coins. Um, <laughs> it's not about the money piece. But what we've done is we've actually taken a stand and we've said, functional language learning matters. If we start with function at the premise and at the beginning, instead of a structure that we've had for a long, long time, which says, here's grammar, let's fit these structures on top, right? In Spanish, an example we have a lot of is the reflexive verbs. Everyone can tell me where reflexive verbs are in every Spanish text. Where? Anyone who teaches Spanish, you know? It's probably the same in French, I guess. Anyone know? Daily routines. Yeah, wash yourself. Yeah. Hey, Carl, what'd you do this morning? Oh, Julie, let me tell you, I got up and first I brushed my teeth and then I got in the shower and then I brushed my... What? Right? We never tell people that part about our day unless we're figuring out a schedule for who's going to get up first and shower first and we have all this stuff going on or... Oh my gosh, it was this crazy day. You're never going to believe what happened. I was brushing my hair and the brush fell apart and then my hair dryer stopped working, right? There are very specific reasons, but that is not where we inherently use reflexive verbs. What we've done historically, traditionally, is we've said we need a communicative function. We know communicative language teaching is important in this country. We're going to put this function on top of this grammar point and make it look communicative. 
right? The opposite is actually where we started. So what we did is we said, well, what functions do learners at the novice level need? What functions at the intermediate do learners need? And how do we get there? And how do we pull apart structure to get at that? So what you see here is just a sample from the scope and sequence, but it takes you through saying hello to your friends and family. What you really need is greetings and nice to meet you. <laughs> right? There's a lexical set, there's a structural set. You see the lexicon first, then you see the structure, you need greeting chunks and question punctuation and word order. It's not void of structure. It's the opposite. It's saying, I want to give you the grammar and the structure you need to be able to make meaningful connection with the function you're accomplishing. Then you, we have two other videos about greeting friends and family, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and then writing down words to remember them, language learning strategies, explicit strategic information on how to learn. Right? I want you to pay attention, ultimately, is what we're saying. Um, to give you a sense of how that pragmatic information gets embedded, there are two pieces. Using hashtags to create meaning. No matter which social media platform you are using, you have to admit that hashtags are hashtag awesome or genial. After all, they can add so much extra meaning to what you're saying. One way they add meaning is by providing some additional context. Are you at the hashtag San Sebastian Film Festival? Or is something new happening right now? Etiqueta ahora? No matter what it is, you can tell people who, what, where, and when with a hashtag simply by adding a word or two. Hashtags also add meaning by facilitating connections. For example, a brand of food can connect itself with a movie by using a hashtag with its title. Individuals can connect themselves with celebrities by using their names with a hashtag. Either way, a sort of digital relationship is created. Another way that hashtags make meaning is by summarizing complex situations. A great example that arose out of the Bolivian water crisis was Etiqueta La Paz Sin Agua. Another great example, Etiqueta Sin Maíz No Hay País, came out of the recent Mexican tortilla crisis. So, no matter what your purpose, make sure to use a hashtag on your next social media post. You just might add a little extra meaning to your message. So in that case, we chose to actually explicitly teach them those pieces. Hopefully the greeting one is next. I thought they were out of oh, order, so... ¿Cómo estás? Now, what do I say? One of the first phrases many people learn in Spanish is ¿Cómo estás? Along with ¿Qué tal? It's just one of the many ways to say, how are you? But before we look at the way people commonly respond to these expressions in Spanish, let's take a minute to think about what you would say in English. Would you instinctively say something like, great, fine, or okay? In English, we often use the phrase, how are you, as a way to simply greet others. There is typically no expectation of a detailed response or any information about how you really feel. In fact, it's often jarring when someone gives a serious or genuine answer. In Spanish, however, ¿Cómo estás? or ¿Qué tal? can be answered with both short and long responses. The question is more often than not a genuine inquiry into someone's well-being, and it's quite common for Spanish speakers to respond with additional information that explains their response. Bueno, estoy bastante preocupada. Tengo examen mañana y no he estudiado. Or, even a short anecdote about their day. Uf, no te la vas a creer, pero esta mañana mientras preparaba el café. Offering more details is a way to build solidarity or closeness in a relationship and express interest in continuing the conversation. So next time someone asks you, ¿Cómo estás? Don't be afraid to tell them how you really feel and get the conversation rolling. And always expect the same when you ask. So if we go back to our original model, right? Knowledge. You've got to know, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Right? You also then need to analyze, which one do I do? When and who do I give explanations to? Do I not give explanations to? Right? I might choose to never give more explanations. That might be a choice, right? I, I, that's not me. I can't do that. Or you might know, like, oh, I actually get to tell people this is my day. 
right? Awareness is knowing that this difference even occurs, right? We can start this week one of a Spanish class. It doesn't have to be something that waits till study abroad. It doesn't have to be something that people do eventually when they get good enough, right? The other thing I really like about when we start digging into discourse is we can actually use this then for other pieces, right? Writing assessment, first two weeks of class. Hey, fill out my comic about how people greeted each other. And all of a sudden you have, right, the explanation that has to occur in a very real way. Um, in the app, learners not only watch the video, but then they get to play games that actually reinforce those issues. The strategy, they get to, they have to make decisions, they get to play trivia, they get to sort words. We also look at lexicon and structure and all these pieces um, to be able to really dive into the way lexicon, structure, pragmatic strategies all work together to accomplish the kinds of things we do with language every day. Um, again, freely available, scalable. The whole idea is how do we get this out into the world in ways that people can do something with it. Um, the last piece I'm going to talk about, and then I promise to wrap up, is IPIC. This is uh, one of the projects that we're maybe most excited about and most challenged by. So if in a year from now this hasn't happened, you can hold me accountable for saying, oh, keep trying. But we don't know exactly how it's going to come out, to be totally honest. Um, IPIC is a partnership with another language resource center, AELRC, out of Georgetown University and the Center for Applied Linguistics. And the goal of this project really is to develop a digital simulation for assessing this framework. In other words, can we put an IPIC score next to an OPI score and give you a more accurate picture of how well a learner will do? Right? You might only be advanced mid proficiency level but you might have a really high IPIC score, right? That might make you better abroad than a superior level learner with a really low IPIC score. I mean, yes, it will make you better, hopefully, if we can get the test right. I mean, that's the trick, right? So we are starting with Korean and Spanish, um, and then we'll have an English test version as well, to one, provide instructors with a profile of their students' intercultural competence or pragmatic competence, and enable them to have then appropriate instructional interventions. The way we are doing this is through digital games and simulations. So you go in, you have a series of people you have to interact with, those pieces about feedback and agency. The goal is you need to accomplish these tasks. We then pause the assessment and we say, hey, why did you do that? getting at subjectivity, getting at reflection. Um, we're looking at it across three domains, so looking at peer-to-peer -peer interaction, service encounters, and um, professional encounters for five language functions, greetings, leave-takings, requests, refusals, and invitations, all of which in some way can be engaged across those three domains and down different sort of levels of intensity, power, distance, et cetera. So I don't have anything to show you yet because we just finished the models and the storyboards, but I wanted to let you know that's sort of where we're going. If we start from these sort of commercial game, wraparound spaces, mobile stuff, AR in the middle, all the way through to eventually we want to be able to test this, which is what's going to make it matter long term sort of in the world at large. Um, from there, hopefully, the idea is where, what, how, and what do we do with all of this to make it a reality in language classrooms. With that, I will leave it open for questions and discussion. I promised Carl less than an hour, so there you go. 53 minutes, maximal learning length, right? All right. So we have plenty of time for questions about games that Julie's working on or the research that they've conducted or? So for a high school student that wants to supplement their classroom instruction, would Linger Go be a good platform? Absolutely, yep. Oh, sorry, the question was um, for a high school student wanting to supplement their language learning, would Linger to Go be a good option? And the answer is yes. We have high school students all over the country who have just started using it and find it to be really, middle school as well. Um, it's free. Yep. Um, there is a way to sort of level up quicker if you spend money, but no one thus far really has needed to. So we have all kinds of data. No one spent very much money, which is good. I like that. It's okay. So everybody knows Duolingo. So how is it different from that? that 
In a perfect world, you'd use them both together. Duolingo is all about grammar translation and one-to-one -one lexical meaning. So in other words, you translate something and you learn the one-to-one -one lexical meaning. If we take the word like coffee, which I just used, the reality is there are lots of meanings for the word coffee, and so Duolingo misses that. If you really want to drill vocabulary, right, if we're looking at high-frequency drilling vocabulary only, Duolingo is not a bad choice. If you want to do that in combination with this more comprehensive picture, lingo to go is the way to go. You get still that you still get lexicon. It's not void of that. Um, it's just shelled within language functions. Twenty-five words a unit is essentially what you get. And uh, for some of the games you're talking about, um, what's the general like, age range of people using it? And um, like, and how could they like be catered to like uh, engage adults more? Because I work a lot of uh, adult. Um, LT learners, and they're always looking for new ways to practice the language in a more like functional, communicative manner. So, would something like this like be like too like like almost juvenile for them, or like? So we haven't. I mean, we don't have a ton of empirical data yet on Lingo to Go. It's pretty brand new, but we I've seen. It, I mean, so I was just with a group of my parents' friends, actually, and I'm like, could you all stop playing? We're actually supposed to be doing something. So um, I think that that's definitely, I don't think that's it's sort of age agnostic in that space. When we're talking about commercial games, it just depends on the group of people, right? There are some groups of adult learners who are way into sort of the game space, if not so more than some of the college kids who have all these other competing priorities. Um, in other instances, it's like, I'm not touching a video game from a mile away. So it's sort of having to pick what's best. We always try to just give choices. I mean, I think that's what I've learned the most about this kind of work. It's a little bit more work. But just giving one game is a bad choice. <laughs> in other words, so not everyone engages with the same kinds of games even. And so um, some people love shooter games. Some people hate them. Some people are adamantly opposed to them. And so if that's the only option you give, that's, I'm not advocating shooter games for the record, unless you have learners who are really into that anyway. And I'm like, please play in French. Um, and so, <laughs> right, uh, sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but then, and then also, like, especially like, um, like more like elderly learners, yeah. may not be super technologically adept. So like how, do we, how can we like engage them? Engage them. So I used, has anyone heard of Samba de Amigo? It's a Portuguese game. It's a Portuguese music game, actually. And um, it's for the Wii. And what's super cool about it is you actually play along, and then all these words sort of, it's Portuguese, so it's a little different. There are other ones, I think, actually now available in other languages. My 85-year-old uh, and 90-year-old grandparents loved it. Can we play that game thing you have, Julia? Right? Because you can sit, you can do it. There was some really fun stuff around that. Um, and so it's just a matter of sort of finding the right game, I think. Um, we have a database on that Games to Teach site that gets you going there about now 150 games, I think, in the database. And so it's worth digging into. And you can put in the language, and everything available in that language pops up. And then you can start sort of digging through. Um, I'd highly advocate playing at least two hours of any game before you put it in any classroom. Just like we'd never show a film we haven't watched, we shouldn't use a game we've never played. <laughs> I know it seems obvious, like it, you'd be so surprised. I gave this to my students and I can't believe, I'm like, did you play? Like it's in level two, right? Those kinds of things. especially uh, great for courses taught in a blended learning environment. Absolutely. This is learning uh, classes uh, for language learning. So I have two questions. One is, um, uh, do you have any data that shows, you know, assessment data that shows those courses that are using game, link, game learning uh, as a part of uh, the, the whole language learning um, is, is produce more, more or, or superior um, student learning outcomes compared to a regular class, which don't use you know, game learning. Um, and the second question is, uh, it's more practical. If uh, I'm the language instructor, if I want to assign a game for my students, um, how, how, how do I sign them? Like, do I, do I tell them, okay, just do unit one? And what's unit one in a game, you know, scenarios? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to answer your first question, there are a couple studies that have looked at control groups as compared to um, sort of a game-based group looking at lexicon in some cases. In my case, the data actually bears out no difference. Um, I think the trick is the field is too new to give you an actual empirical answer to that. I would love to be able to say, yeah, of course games are superior. 
That's not true. Um, what we don't know is if games are superior at giving us a more comfort. It's a different picture, right? It actually gives us a way to teach the things we haven't been teaching in classrooms. So is it better than, I don't actually think games are better at teaching vocab and structure. We can do just as well with sticky notes. Better maybe, right? We can sort them, we can create maps, we can do all kinds of things. What games are better at is saying, hey, language is more than just the words. Language has this whole other world around it, and that's what we should pay attention to. Um, what we know about Lingro to Go, for example, is it has some morphological games and some of the puzzle stuff, which digs them into some of that. But it, again, isn't just about sort of the unit and the chapter test. So a lot has to do with the research design, the questions we're asking, the perspectives we're looking at it from. Um, Jonathan DeHaan has done some really interesting work on lexical learning, and he's actually found no difference. Um, if anything, the game learners did less, maybe, the players, than the know. So um, I think we have to approach this field with a discerning eye, just like we do with everything else. The trick is the potential there is so clear. Um, and the way to get at pragmatic specifically at these more macro level skills is what really is interesting. I think um, that's, um, that's my perspective. That's not everyone's, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm also wondering if there is, if we would look at affect and the ability for games to get and keep students more engaged and to sustain that engagement over a long period. Yes. Which might go motivation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would argue motivation is the result, not the reason. So I've said that lots. Um, not everyone agrees with that. And it's changing and shifting and dynamic. Um, but yes, I think that is a real key point. It gives you the ability to actually give learners engagement in their own domain, right? If someone wants to play a soccer sort of simulation game, perfect. If another learner has no interest in that, they just want to do art, they can do flower, right? There are all these sort of different pieces around um, getting at that sort of space that, yeah, absolutely um, gets at. Some learners hate it, to be very clear. Um, I'd love to stand up here and be like, yes, games are the way to go. It's not that. It's that they're really worth our attention to get some better understanding of what's good and bad about them. So clearly most of your work and most people here are interested in uh, second language acquisition. Do, do, you, do you know of any work in this field being done uh, with people with language learning disabilities, language acquisition disabilities like autism or, or other disabilities? Is that yeah, that's probably one of my favorite areas actually. So they've been using avatars in games for autism, so neuroatypical sort of training for kids and for and hugely important results, right? So pragmatics is actually what tends to be void, right, in the brain. So the inability to do pragmatics with language is what we see on sort of the autism Asperger's spectrum. And so actually you can, they found with kids specifically, and I don't know about adults because it's not my area as well, but I've read a lot of work where they can actually train with avatars and you start by having no eye contact and then they can actually systematically create eye contact with the avatar that the learner doesn't feel uncomfortable with. So with humans, we either have eye contact or we have no eye contact, right? With avatars, it can be sort of a slip, and they can actually computerize what that glance looks like. And that has been pretty effective in terms of a therapeutic intervention for getting learners used to like, oh, I'm comfortable with this now. And then they can make the avatars more and more realistic. And so um, they've seen a lot of benefit with that kind of work for kids. Um, we haven't done it yet. I, we're not getting there. My hope is something like Lingro to go. Actually, it's fully screen reader compatible, so we can start looking at sort of blindness and deafness in languages using sort of all of the stuff that's already there on our phones. We're not there yet. We have a graduate student who's interested in doing that kind of work, though. So there's tons of potential and actually quite a bit of grant money out there to do work, um, especially with uh, language training and sort of neuroatypical spaces and avatars and games. Yeah, there's quite a the, bit. The whole idea of like mediation is really important. So it's not face to face. So when people, like Julie said, therapeutic interventions. So people who have it, social problems, um, sometimes because it's mediated and it's not so direct, it's easier for them to actually have these interactions. And even do like eye contact, but you're not really looking at their eyes, you're looking at the camera and the, all those kinds of things. So yeah. It's yeah. Eight years ago, my, I, I put my son in front of Rosetta Stone, mm -hmm. Spanish. We didn't have any other Spanish input. 
and he learned Spanish grammar and gender before he learned English. Grammar. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, gender. It's, yeah. uh, it's, I'm interested in the fact that he's. Yeah, I believe it. There's a really cool, oh, I wish I could remember the name. There's a super cool program for kids with avatar interaction stuff that's really, really effective. Um, we don't have very good data on it yet, but in second language especially. Um, but I've always been sort of compelled by it in terms of, yeah, maybe we're going the right way. Um, that's the trick, right? Interdisciplinary. I have a question about the meta-analysis you did of all the studies that are yeah. looking at ICC and pragmatic competence and what is that? So um, I agree, it's like kind of people don't know exactly what it is. But so I was thinking you wrote down your, the, these four areas. And is that, like, you went over quickly, IPIC at the very That's, end? I, IPIC so, is the assessment measure to get at that model, yeah. Okay. So we're calling that the IPIC model, right? That. Interactional, pragmatic, intercultural competence. Okay. And those were the four... So is, it's kind of messed up, but knowledge, analysis, subjectivity, awareness. And okay, so you, you said that it, it, you haven't really done this yet, but with OPIs or other kinds of measures of like functional language yes. ability, mm -hmm. that you'll be able to do some kind of comparative <laughs> testing. So basically, <coughs> IPIC exists as a, as a, as a test but you haven't really done it yet. IPIC exists as a storyboarded test that is almost ready to pilot two weeks from now. Okay. That will be built out hopefully as part of the next cycle. So the goal this cycle was to do the theoretical analysis and figure out what the heck we are going to actually test. So define the construct and that's where we're at. So yeah, the, I mean, we're getting there for sure. Um, but no, it's not ready as a test quite yet, but um, the pilot stuff we're looking at. Um, we go. And is it based on performance or is it also like metalinguistic awareness? Both. It, both? Yeah, performance and um, performance actually, so both production and perception, uh -huh. as well as metalinguistic and um, reflective protocols. Okay. okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So the reflective protocols and the more subjective um, assessment pieces will be done with inner rater reliability stuff and looking at raters, and then the other is objective built into the algorithms of the machine. Um, oh, is it, is it online? It'll or? be a simulation, yeah. So a it'll simulation. be a full online game um, simulation module that goes cool. with it. Nice. Probably 2D. I don't know that we gain anything in 3D, so it'll be an avatar-based game kind of simulation. Right. Yeah. These games, do you usually assign them as part of the homework? Or do oh, you yeah, that was her question. In the classroom? I've seen it done all kinds of different ways. So Mentira, we actually put it in as a full unit in a fourth semester Spanish course. So we did it for a full month, once a week, half the class period. And then they went out as the field trip was the two hours out in the neighborhood finding their clues. Then they did a trial in the course. It replaced one oral presentation where they did two days of oral presentations and no one listened, right? You, you, so that was where that went. Um, I've seen the wraparound activities be used as extra credits. You could go that far off the end of the spectrum. What we know, though, is that integration in the classroom environment is more important than just, hey, here's a homework thing to do. So if you really want to get at the issues, especially in the games to teach games, if you really want to dig into economics and you really want to dig into healthcare issues and racism, you can't leave learners to their own devices, right? They need someone to scaffold that. And that's what our job is, right, as professors and instructors, is help them sort of dig through. And the game gives you a space to add some protection in terms of like, yeah, let's dig in. But you don't actually have to know my perspectives all the time. You get to just look at what happens in the game and let them sort of co-construct and construct their realities based on those experiences. Um, yeah. So, and the trick is sort of creating a disposition, not a right answer, right? An openness to be willing to engage in these issues. Um, we sort of stay away from them for good reason in some cases, right? But um, especially in high school environments. So these are actually being used as well in high schools, um, which is even more sort of tenuous, right? How do we talk about this stuff? Nice. 
Um, grading, rubrics, I didn't answer your question. So the best way to grade, I think, in these cases is rubrics based on your learning outcome. Classic backwards design, what do I want my learners to know? How am I gonna grade it? Awesome, any other questions? Thank you for your attention on a Friday. Thank you.